Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to The Correct Views. Sam I.B. DeGange reporting for the media speaks, or as I like to say, political commentary for the media speaks. Because it was pointed out to me that since I'm very opinionated, it's actually not reporting, it's political commentary. Fair enough. Point taken. All right, friends, um, this is where, like, sometimes running a political show kind of sucks, and I'll tell you why. Unlike partying with Christelle and a friend of mine, both of which are in the studio, and if you hear them, they're here, you're having, like, a great night, and then you're like, man, it's time to go on the air and give people the worst news in freaking history, and see if you can just really down yourself to no end. See if you can go from a good mood to a really crappy mood in no time at all. In a half hour, I hope I'm totally miserable. I don't know. Friends, nothing I have to report is any good, and I'm in a good mood, so we're going to go with it. Uh, Kit Daniels, PrisonPlanet.com. Obama suggests Islamic extremists have legitimate grievances. Now, at first you would argue, all right, I understand what he's saying. He's saying that the Palestinians don't have a place to call their own. Well, that wouldn't be ISIS. You wouldn't imply that your average Islamist was ISIS. That's like implying that your average Christian is a member of the Westboro Baptist Church. It doesn't make any sense. He used the worst analogy ever. He implied that ISIS represents Islam. Listen to this. President Obama suggested that radical Islamic groups such as ISIS, which beheads Christians and other Muslims, um, people of their own, they kill their own, by the way, like Hitler did, and other Muslims for not obeying Sharia law can only be stopped if governments are willing to listen to their legitimate grievances. Governments that deny human rights play into the hands of extremists who claim that violence is the only way to achieve change, he wrote in his op-ed published by the LA Times. Quote, efforts to counter violence extremism will only succeed if citizens can address legitimate grievances through the democratic process and express themselves through strong civil societies. Come on, it says. How does ISIS which subjects women to abnormal sex acts through forced marriages, executes children for watching soccer, and beheads Christians using cinder blocks and machetes have legitimate grievances. Here's a grievance in a nutshell. Obey Sharia law or be executed. That's that's what they're saying. Um, I'm going to go in. I have three more stories dealing with ISIS, and then as the title implies, we're going to do the police abuse here. Let's listen to some of their legitimate grievances. Again, I'm not saying that this is the voice of Islam. I bet you there's a lot of Islamists that are listening to this that agree with me. It is Obama, our dear leader, who said that ISIS, not Islam, had legitimate grievances. Well, let's see what ISIS's legitimate freaking grievances are. Independent.co.uk ISIS Raqqa wives subjected to brutal sex assaults after marrying militants. Well, I mean, they didn't want to have sex, so they grabbed them by the hair, did horrible things to them, made them sleep in the wet spot, and get, didn't give them a good night kiss. What, that's their legitimate grievance? Women living under ISIS's self-declared caliphate are being subjected to brutal, abnormal sex acts and are becoming too scared to leave their homes, a local activist group has claimed. Obama wants to know what these animals' grievances are. Many women and young girls are being forced to marry ISIS militants in the group's de facto capital of Raqqa in Syria, and are then reportedly beaten, began searching for wives after taking over a swath of the city. It says militants introduced a series of crackdowns designed to coerce women into marriage, such as prohibiting them from traveling or working without a male relative. In other words, you have no life at all unless you marry us, and then we will rape you nightly. Abu Mohab Hassam, one of the RBSS activists living outside of Raqqa, said women who walk around without male guardians are constantly harassed. He said, quote, girls and women are between the ages of 9 and 59? 9 and 50 are sent to special education centers to learn the Quran and give lessons on how to be good wives. 
Now, this is going to create a problem that we had in World War II. There was uh, the Hitler Youth, which would take large numbers of the youth and put them into the Hitler, what was called the Hitler Youth. You had to be in it or you were considered a nutcase. And then you were indoctrinated with things like believing that God had cursed black people because they were dark and it was the, 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 the curse of uh, Cain and Abel. You were fed this BS. And then, of course, when World War II was over and Hitler lost, you had all these people that had to learn real history all over again. You're finding this now in the Middle East under ISIS, who we should listen to because they have legitimate grievances. The RBSS report claimed ISIS members took advantage of poverty-stricken families by offering high dowries in exchange for marrying their daughters. The poorest person listening to this is there any way that you would sell your daughter as the solution? I have a feeling they did it at gunpoint. This article doesn't make any sense. I literally, I don't believe it at all. And Mr. Hassam said he spoke with three women between, it's what it says, between the ages of 19 and 29 who have allegedly been abused by ISIS members. One woman told him she was hospitalized after a fighter that she was forced to marry sexually assaulted her. And it's funny because the article in The Independent says, a woman is seen walking down the street in Raqqa. You should go to the site. The woman that is seen is not seen. Isis has her dressed like the Grim Reaper. She is in a black burqa with her eyes sticking out. You have a better idea of what the Lone Ranger looks like than what this poor woman looks like. And they're saying that the woman is seen. He told the Independent, some women say that foreign fighters are the worst, like monsters. Some say they're asking for strange things. They are also looking to marry young girls. Yeah, by the age of nine. He said the fighters will often take more than one wife and search for Sabaya. That is a woman who has been kidnapped and sold into sexual slavery. What's funny is that they're walking around saying how immoral the U.S. is. I'll tell you what, friends. We have swingers clubs in the U.S., we have uh, adult nightclubs, I know, I DJ in one. We have people drawing characters of Mohammed. I'm a Christian. We have death metal bands that wish that I was dead because I'm a Christian. You know what we don't have? We don't have people taking over the neighboring city and raping the wives into submission because the people we took over were immoral. This is the most ridiculous argument I've ever seen. It's not like they're coming to your country and bringing Puritanism. Um, Michael Snyder, end of the American dream. ISIS is painting the Middle East red with the blood of Christians. And this is where I wish I wasn't in a good mood because nothing to be reported here is good. It says, every day now there are fresh news stories about Christians being slaughtered by ISIS in the Middle East. So where is the outrage from the White House? We've gone over that. Where is the outrage from the Islamic world? Now that is kind of frightening here. Listen to where he goes with this article. If Islam truly was a religion of peace, prominent Islamic leaders all over the globe would be loudly condemning ISIS whenever another slaughter of Christians took place. The White House statement about the beheading of 21 Egyptian Coptic Christians by ISIS the other day did not have the word Christian in, a single, in, in the article a single time. ISIS is painting the Middle East red with the blood of Christians, and most of the world seems to be very, very... Uh, it seems to care very, very little. If thousands of people from some politically favored group or religion were being slaughtered or killed, the outcry would be deafening. But because Christians are being killed, it is not such a big deal. So exactly what does that say about how the world views Christians in 2015? Without a doubt, Christians are being specifically targeted by ISIS. They are simply not going to submit to Islamic rules, amen, and belief system that ISIS intends to impose on the areas that it conquers. So they are considered a, quote, problem that needs to be dealt with. When 21 Coptic Christians were beheaded by ISIS jihadists in Libya, it shocked Christians all over the world. Those that realize, released the video entitled, A Message Signed with the Blood to the Nation of the Cross, Clearly, it was intended to strike fear into the hearts of Christian believers all over the planet, but the White House reaction did not contain the word Christian, Islam, or Muslim. Um, so what is it exactly that they're asking? 
They're asking you to totally submit to Sharia law, and there's absolutely nobody sticking up for the Christians whatsoever. And it is mildly worrisome that we're looking at a situation where, and I don't want this to happen, I'm not saying it should happen. Let's say we took, um, I'm not even going to put a name on it. The worshippers of this vitamin water bottle. We're going to go ahead and we're going to slaughter them. Everybody would be like, oh, they slaughtered these people that weren't bothering anybody at all. And yet, when Christians are being slaughtered by the thousands, it is odd that the peaceful Muslims don't say more than they have been. That is rather weird. Um, last on your ISIS update, cnsnews.com, Reverend Graham Islamic State's ultimate agenda is to hasten the final apocalypse. Now, I'm going to let you leave your comments on this. Franklin Graham is implying that the ISIS war is the war in the book of Revelations. Do I think that that is the case? I'm not going to say that. That seems to me to be a very big leap because every generation that has ever lived through all of Christendom automatically assumes that their generation is the one that is so terrible that it's going to be the one that brings the second coming. And that's not what I'm saying, but it's interesting to see the similarities. And I say that because the book of Revelations talks about beheading. And uh, when I was growing up, I remember you go to Sunday school or whatever, and the, they would teach you that that meant that you were uh, likely to be shot or executed or whatever, but we don't really do beheadings anymore. And then, like, as of about 12 years ago, suddenly there was a clearly evil entity that was beheading people. So it, it calls to mind that a lot of people are saying that, all right, well, since beheading is back, this has to be the one that's the end of everything. I don't know if it is or not, but I will give you the analogy that is in this report. It says the barbaric actions of the Islamic State, which beheaded 21 Coptic Christians over the weekend and posted the slaughter online, should come as no surprise because these radical Muslims are evil and the depravity is fully in keeping with their goal, which is, quote, hastening the final apocalypse, said Franklin Graham. Um, it's, it says, uh, he quotes the Bible and says that the word tells us that the final battle of the day will result in the defeat of Satan and those who are allied with him. And it goes on and on and on to mention that there is a similarity between the, the, what they're saying is about to happen, particularly with beheading and what's going on here. It says in the Atlantic Magazine on March 2015, reporter Graham Wood wrote an extensive article that the Islamic State and noted the reality is that the Islamic State is Islamic, very Islamic. Yes, it has attracted psychopaths and adventure seekers, adventure seekers everywhere you look, drawn largely from disaffected populations of the Middle East and Europe. But the religion preached by its most ardent followers derives from coherent and even learned interpretations of Islam. Virtually, it says every major decision and law promulgated by the Islamic State adheres to what it calls press and pronouncements, and on its billboards, license plates, stationery, and coins, the prophetic methodology, which means following the prophecy and example of Muhammad in punctuous detail, I said Wood. Let me keep reading this. It says, in the gruesome video, a message signed with the blood of the nation of the cross, posted February 15th of the beheading of 21 Egyptian Christians, the Islamic State narrator says, quote, O people recently... You have seen us on the hills of Asham and Dabik's plain, chopping off the heads and have been carrying out the Christian cross for a long time. And today we are on the south of Rome in the island of Islam, Libya, sending another message. Now remember, this wasn't going on when Fuzzy Head, um, that would be um, Muammar Gaddafi, this wasn't going on when Gaddafi was in charge of Libya. Am I saying that, he, therefore, Gaddafi was this wonderful man? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Rather, he was very good at keeping different factions of Islam and Christians and the small population of Jews. Everyone got along there. You can find video of Gaddafi rolling along happily in his topless car. Nobody's shooting at him. Um, no more than average um, 
um, or it wouldn't be the uh, CIA. What's the Libyan equivalent of the CIA? I don't know. His guards. No more than average guards. Certainly not the level of guards that we have every time the president uh, has a speech here. He was popular enough that with all those warring factions, they didn't kill him. Now we've got this mess in Libya, largely because of what Bush's policies and Obama's actions have done to Libya. This wasn't happening before we toppled Gaddafi. Now it's a mess. It was much better under him. And again, I'm not saying he was a great man. All Christian crusaders, they say, safety for you will be only wishes, especially if you are fighting for us all together, says the narrator. Therefore, we will fight for you all together. The sea you have hidden Sheikah Osama bin Laden's body in, we swear to Allah we will mix it with your blood. After the Islamic State killers cut off the heads of Egyptian men, the narrator says, and we will conquer Rome by Allah's permission, the promise of our prophet, peace be upon him, these are the great and noble people of ISIS who our dear leader, President Obama, says has legitimate grievances. Islamists listening to this? Obama, not me. I, I don't agree with him. Obama has lumped you in with ISIS. Friends, you're listening to the correct views, and if you're here for the, um, p the uh, police state update, don't worry. There are five stories left for you. I just want to remind you real quick to check out the work of Mike McLaughlin. Go to Facebook.com. I hate Facebook, but go there anyway and look up Mike McLaughlin, M-A-C, laugh, Lynn, and uh, let him know you heard about his show here on The Correct Views. He's a writer, and if you're someone like I am, you read books. At least I used to before this show. You read books. You look for good fiction. Nothing's worse than sitting down to a book, giving you an hour or two into it, and realizing it's terrible. If you're reading uh, works of Mike McLaughlin, you'll be very happy, because that won't be the case. Everything he writes is top-notch. Get a hold of him on Facebook. Let him know you want to see some of his work. Let him know you heard about it from the correct views. We're going to move on. This is from Reason.com, and it is brought to you from Change Transportation. Are you within about a 50-mile radius of Canton, Ohio? If you are, then uh, find out how much it's going to cost to get where you need to go, particularly a greater distance the further you get from Canton. And then price match it with other transportation agencies and taxis in the area. Then call Change Transportation and he will either beat the price or match it. Change Transportation, you can find them on Facebook as well. Again, that's the only thing that Facebook is good for. Reason.com, ban on government license plate cameras nears in Montana. Now, for those of you that think that this is going to be an all-out attack on all police officers, let me let you know that is not the case. First of all, you can look up many instances on this show. Uh, please hit subscribe. makes it easier. Um, type in cops, type in police. You'll find that I praise them often. Um, case in point. The story I told about a week and a half ago when I was uh, snowboarding and my car got, my van got stuck. The police officer, uh, Officer 183 of the Canton Police Department, brought his flashlight out, came over, tried to get my car out of the, uh, the hole that it, snow hole that it was in. I couldn't get it out. He tried. A AAA came. He made sure nobody bothered us and off he went. He never even, he didn't harass us. He didn't bother us. He didn't assume, assume we were doing something nefarious just because I have long hair. He was awesome. Um, I was hanging Christmas lights uh, last uh, December, and a police officer drove down the street, and I'm hanging out the window. It's like four in the morning, and I'm hanging Christmas lights. Well, this white light hits me, and uh, the cop, you know, asks something to the effect of, "What are you doing?" And I said, "I'm hanging Christmas lights, officer. This is my uh, this is my the duplex that I live in." And the, uh, another officer pulled up beside him, and once they saw the Christmas lights, he goes, oh, all right, just checking, and he drove away. You know what? That's awesome. Okay? I am delighted beyond all comprehension that a cop will not drive down the street, see someone hanging out my window, and not at least ask what they're doing there in the middle of the night. That's, that's good policing. Well, there's bad policing. And if you look up the poor woman here at 4.20 in the morning that I reported on about two weeks ago, where um, she was pulled over for a DUI, they strapped her down to a table, 
and abused her with needles to get her blood against her will. That is police abuse. And these are people that have no business having any um, tangibility in anything that is going to interact with society on a regular basis. And I think everyone listening to me would agree with everything I've just said thus far. Well, let's go on to the reporting on it here. Cops in Big, count, big Sky Country aren't happy about it. But Montana lawmakers look ready to ban the use of license plate cameras, as they should, by government agencies to track motorists' movements. The legislative move comes after a stream of revelations of local, state, and federal tracking and databasing of Americans' movements by car without cause or warrant. A year ago, the Department of Homeland Security killed a solicitation for bids to establish and maintain a national license plate recognition database service. Establish and maintain, excuse me, after a chorus of public outrage. And page keeps refreshing, don't you? You can go to reason.com if you question what I'm saying, but get ready for every pop-up and shockwave flash ad you've ever seen. It says the DHS plan may actually have been a duplication of another effort since the DEA already has a national license plate scanning system maintained with the cooperation of local police. If passed, the Montana measure couldn't block such efforts from D.C., but it would prevent agencies within the state from contributing to those schemes. Approved by the House Judiciary Committee on February 13th, the FBI 344 states an agency or employee of the state or any subdivision of the state may not use, either directly or indirectly, a license, license plate scanner or any public highway with limited exceptions. Those exceptions include way stations for commercial trucks, city planning so long as driver and vehicle anonymity is maintained, parking control, and tracking of government vehicles. And of course, the police in Montana are wanting to say that they should be allowed to use these things because they believe that they should be allowed to spy on you in any way you want, that the Fourth Amendment is simply outdated, should be abolished, and uh, you should shut up and do whatever they tell you to do. Sig Heil. This is KRAM.com. Colorado man cuffed for refusing to share video with police. Now, I, I, a lot of you might not know this, but the Supreme Court of the land has, in fact, ruled that you are allowed to film police officers. I have done so, and uh, again, I'm, I've never gotten in trouble for doing so. That seems to be mind-blowingly difficult for some police to understand. It is not illegal to film somebody in a public environment. Lakeside, Colorado, a Lakeside Walmart customer pulled out his cell phone in front of the store, that is a public uh, area for the Kesha fans, <coughs> on Monday evening to capture video of Lakeside police arresting a man suspected of shoplifting. The man is shooting the video, Chris Hoover, didn't expect he'd end up in handcuffs too. The video shows two police officers wrestling the man to the ground. When they get the man in cuffs, one officer realizes there is a camera. During the commotion, the officer points at the camera and says that the phone is evidence I want it. Hoover then says it's mine. For those of you that want to know how to defeat that, uh, stream your videos. Go to Google Hangout or go elsewhere. I really don't like Google, so I'd rather you went somewhere else. I'm just trapped into being here. Um, Go to Google, go to anything that streams a video, Skype, anything. They can't take it. They can't erase it. It's, it's, on, it's on the net. It's streamed. It's live. It can't be taken away. That's how you get around that, by the way. That is the correct view. It goes on. He snatched it out of my hand. I wasn't going to resist. He grabbed my wrist and then put me in cuffs, Hoover said. And again, according to the, uh, the rights established in the Constitution, that is illegal on the side of the cops. Lakeside police would not go on camera, citing an ongoing investigation. However, they did say they stand by their officers. They say police have a right to detain someone if they have video of a crime. What? What? He has a video of an arrest. He didn't have a video of the crime. Are they saying that arresting the man was a crime? Because he didn't have a video of the crime. 
the crime was shoplifting. He didn't film shoplifting. He filmed the arrest. He said, look, you have two choices, Hoover explained. He said, either I will arrest you right here or right now for obstructing justice. That's why you want to be streaming. And then we will get a search warrant and we'll get your phone and we will get that piece of video as police evidence. The ACLU of Colorado says police can get a search warrant, but that the phone typically should remain with the owner until the warrant is obtained. And that is absolutely correct. Police officers can ask for a copy or ask for the video. But in the absence of a warrant to actually seize someone's personal property, I don't think police officers can seize it or threaten to seize it, except in the most extreme emergency situations, ACLU Colorado Director Mark Silverstein said. The ACLU is either mind-blowingly right or mind-blowingly wrong. Who agrees? Hoover eventually gave in. He sent the officer a copy of the recording via email. It made me want to be angry, but honestly, I was scared, Hoover said. Silverstein said more regula regulations may need to be put in place. Police departments need to establish policies and training so that the police officers understand that the public has a right to take photographs, has the right to make videos, and that police officers, only in the most limited of circumstances, can even think about seizing property as so-called evidence. So uh, that, that's at least, I'm glad the guy's fighting back. Uh, three more stories to get to. Indian man visits family in Alabama. Cops paralyze him for walking around the neighborhood. Did he commit a crime? No, he did not. Infowars. A 57-year-old Indian man visiting his family in Alabama has been left paralyzed after police body slammed him to the ground in an exchange that occurred when the man went for a stroll around the block. Sure... I'm going to butcher this poor name. Shurish Habay Shurbshe Patel, a, a farmer from the small town of India, whose name I butchered, was visiting his son, three years a U.S. citizen, to help look after his 17-month-old grandson. When he decided to take a look around the neighborhood, someone called the cops and reported Mr. Patel, who had been approved as a permanent resident of the United States as a suspicious person. In other words, he had every right to be here. The officers arrived on the scene, and upon discovering Mr. Patel couldn't speak English very well, began to pat him down. Patel is said to have reportedly told them that he couldn't speak English and pointed to his son's house, also repeating his son's phone number, but to no avail. So he even gives a phone number. The cops know he has no ability to speak English. It doesn't take a genius to figure it out. If you look at the picture of the man, he doesn't look like a threat. He looks like he's, he's he looks older than what they said he was, to tell you the truth. He doesn't look like a, a real threat to anyone. One of the officers grabbed him by the arm and twisted it behind his back and slammed him to the ground face first. It says the resulting injury left Patel bleeding and temporarily paralyzed. He was later hospitalized and had to undergo surgery to fuse two vertebrae due to swelling in his spine. Pause. My father, God rest his soul, had a miserable back pain. And he knew from many patients that fusing vertebrae surgery is one of the most intensely uncomfortable things that you can possibly think of. Patel has regained, it says, some motion in his arms and left leg, but his right leg remains paralyzed, according to the report. Patel, who previously had no health issues, now faces lengthy therapy in order to fully recover. He was a perfectly healthy man before this. He was just walking on the sidewalk, as he does all the time, said his son, Shirag Patel, who is taking a master's degree in electrical engineering at the University of Alabama. So, I mean, this is like the whole family was legitimate in contributing to society in every way here. It says that they put him on the ground, and this is a good neighborhood. I didn't expect anything to happen, the younger Patel added. An incident report written by the officers in question notes a communication barrier, it says, led to the escalation. The subject began putting his hands in his pockets, reads the police statement. Officers attempted to pat the subject down, and he attempted to pull away. The subject was forced to the ground, which resulted in injury, it reads, while they had no business bothering him to begin with. Video and audio of the incident was captured but remains in the hands of police department pending an investigation. 
The Patel family's attorney, Hank Sherrard, stated this is a broad daylight incident. Walking down the